So to confirm what I was just talking about now, uh, maximum tension force that you can develop in the steel beam itself is gonna be 530 kips. And the maximum compression of the concrete is gonna be 1479 kips. Now the actual compression force in the concrete will not be 1479. This is just what the concrete is able to resist. But the maximum is gonna be limited by the amount of tension that you can develop in the steel because at the end, C needs to be equals to T. Now, when you design the shear transfer mechanism between the concrete to the steel, it's gonna be enough that you just design for the 530 kips because the actual force developed in the steel or concrete will never go above this limit. This concrete limit here is gonna be the maximum compression that the concrete is gonna see. If you put maybe a larger beam size, it's gonna give you more tension force to balance this compression force. So actually, when you do design for the shear transfer mechanism, this 530 caps should be sufficient for your design. Uh, we went through this and then we figured out that this is now um, compression force is gonna be equal to 530 caps. And based on this, we should be able to find out the compression block depth A, very similar to what we do in concrete design. So I'm gonna say maximum compression force is gonna be equal to this tension force, is gonna be 530 kips divided by 0.85, divided by F prime C, the 4K psi, divided by the original width of the concrete slab. So in this case here, we are not gonna be using the transfer. If you remember this transfer, right? When we divide this B divided by N. So in this case, I don't really need that. I just need the action. Why? Because the force that I'm developing here or calculating, this force is gonna be 0.85 F prime C. It is not gonna be that one multiplied by N. This gonna be the actual stress. So I should be using the actual width of the concrete slab was given to me, which is this 87 inches. As you see here, it's almost 1.8 inches for A and the distance from the tension to compression force, this Y, as you see here, the calculations for it is going to be equal to one half of the depth. If this is going to be the total depth, this is going to be one half from this point to that point, plus, and then you add five inches to it to get to the top of the concrete. So here's what you're doing. Let me put some arrow here. So I'm going to say, to figure out the distance from here to there, this is going to be equal to one half of D, D over two, plus the slab thickness, the five inch. So 15.9, total depth of the, slab, of the steel beam, divided by two plus the five inch concrete slab thickness, and then you subtract A over two to come down to that point. So at the end, this gives you your Y, which is right here. The Y distance or Y CT, or some cases equal to Z. So this distance here, again, is gonna be equal to one half of the depth plus slab thickness, subtracting one half of A, which is this number here. Now here's the Y CT distance from compression to tension. Right now, your MN normal capacity is going to be equal to the compression force times Y or tension force times Y. Again, compression or tension is going to be 530 kips. And the distance, as we just calculated out here in the previous slide, was roughly 12 inches. So now, units, this is going to be in kips, this is going to be in inch. Your moment here calculated out is going to be in kip inch. Now, usually you'd like to see it as in kip foot. So what you need to do is divide this number by 12 to be roughly 532 kip foot. Okay. How about the fee factor? Because at the end, I'm going to be doing this LRFD, which is design of trends, right? And also this is going to be like, we are going to be adopting the trends design. So your fee man, all what you need to do is just take the fee factor of 0.9 for beams for flexure, apply by MN with that you have fee man which is the capacity of the steel beam in bending, this composite steel beam. Any questions? John, Wu, Corey, are you there? Guys, I don't see you. I don't know where are you at. That's all right, but you guys, you hear me. All right. All right. 
That's fine. Okay. Now, let's see here in the second example. We'd like to see here the capacity, nominal moment capacity, another example, but we're gonna be using here 60 inches. And it says here, you're gonna be using the tables, but not right now, because we'd like to address the same design methodology that we just have used. And then we need to address this issue of the mechanism, um, the shear transfer mechanism between the steel beam to the concrete. So we're gonna be using this example for that. So now the width becomes 60 inches. Now someone's gonna say, why did you pick 60 inches? The previous example was equal to 87. So what is behind that? How did you pick this width? I understand slab thickness in the previous example was five inches. Now it becomes here four inches. Maybe the steel beam is the same size, right? 16 by 36. Concrete strength, 4K psi. F sub Y, 50K psi. I said, okay. Let me see here another example of doing the same steel beam design. So I'm gonna see here, I'm gonna have here three forces, right? The first one is gonna be the maximum compression force that you can develop in the concrete. The second one is gonna be the maximum tension force that you can develop in the steel. The third one is gonna be the amount of shear studs multiplied by the trends of one shear stud to figure out the total force that you're gonna be able to transfer between the concrete to the steel. So let me read this. It says here full composite action. So when you have full composite action, again, this number for now doesn't matter because I'm gonna be looking at the maximum force that you can develop in both steel and concrete and just design for it. So someone's gonna say maximum force. Okay, let's look here at the information. 0.85 times F prime C times AC, right? 0.85, 4 KSI, 60 times four is gonna be 816. But AS times FY is gonna be equal to 530 kips. Now the maximum force that you really can develop in concrete or steel, it's not gonna be this 816. Reality is gonna be 530 kips only. So this why when I said here, the maximum force that you can develop in both of them, it doesn't mean that you're gonna be taking the 816 and say, this is the maximum force I can design, I can develop in the concrete. Because actually the maximum actual force that you can develop in this beam, the specific beam is gonna be the 530 kips, and this is what you need to design the studs for. So here, here we go. Shear studs will be designed to take the 530 kips, and that's it. Now again, I can figure out compression block depth. So I'm gonna be taking the compression force that I'm able to develop here, the 530 kips, divided by 0.85, divided by F prime C, the 4K psi, right? Divided by 60 inches that I have 2.6. So again, now where is the YCT? This Y distance is gonna be equal to one half of the depth, 1585 divided by two, it says here 1585 divided by two. I'm looking for this term, right? Which is this Y. And then you add the four inches. So let's get you from the center of the beam all the way to the top. And then you subtract one half of A, as it says here, minus half of A. Again, keep inch, divide by 12 to put it in kip foot, and then again, you multiply by 0.9 to find out the fee factor. Very similar to what we have done in the previous example, okay? Just different concrete size. Now let's see where the width is coming from. Why did I take it from 87 to 60 inches? What's behind that? So, right, here's what the code says. For the effective width of the flange, what is the effective width of the flange? Like this width from here to here like this 60 inches for the previous example, example two, A, it was equal to 87 inches. So I need to know how can I come up with this number, right? If I'm doing an actual design. It says here effective width of the concrete slab shall be the sum of the effective width is for each side of the beam center line. Meaning you're gonna have here one effective width, you're gonna say here from here to here, right? And another one from here to there. So let me put another arrow from here to there. So as it says here, this gives you summation of the sum of effective width from each side, which means you need to find this out from this side and also this one's gonna be from this side and just add them to each other. So, okay. Each of which shall not exceed 
So each one of this shall not go beyond one of the three limits. This gives you one eighth of the beam span, center to center support. So here's the beam span, one eighth of that. So let's say the beam span here is equal to, and I need you guys your help to help me with this. I'm going to say, let's say the span is equal. I'm going to put a number here. Let's say 36 feet. The spacing from a beam to a beam, this is spacing. Look at this. The spacing from here to there. And the spacing from here to there, right? So I have two different spacings. Sometimes they're equal to each other. Sometimes they're different, right? So I'm gonna say, let's assume for now that this distance from this beam to this beam is 10 feet. And let's assume now from this distance to that beam, the space between these two beams is only nine feet. Okay? I just want them to be different a little bit so that they can entertain the idea. So it says here, this width from each side is going to be equal to one eighth of the beam span. Can someone help me here and tell me how much is this one eighth of the beam span? How much is that? Yes. Is it four and a half feet? Yeah, please feel free to use uh, the microphone. Just go ahead and say it. Yeah, let's give you four and a half feet. This is correct. Let's see here a few answers. Meaning from here is going to be four and a half feet and from there is going to be four and a half feet. You're going to see here, yeah, this is true. It is not the HB. So I have it from both sides. So total width is how much? Based on the first assumption. For the first item, first requirement, you're going to say B total, right? Equals, you can say nine feet. Now I know where it's coming from, right? I know that in one size, give you four and a half, and size, one size, give you four and a half. Okay? Now the second item, it says one half of the distance to the center line of the adjacent beam. I said, okay. Therefore, from this side, how much is the distance? How much is this? I'm going to say this gives you nine feet, right? So I'm going to say this gives be equal to from the right side, I have four and a half feet. How about from the left side? I'm going to say this here, 10 feet. So it's going to be five feet to that side, right? Five feet is going to be 9.5 feet. Does this make sense? Yes. Make sense this item here? Where it's coming from? Yes. Okay, great. Exactly like tributary width. Absolutely correct. Yeah. Tributary width, but here, since the distance here is different from the distance there, so you got to be careful, right? You don't just take the space, you know, figure that from each side and just add it to each other. And then it says here the distance to the edge of the slab. Well, where's the edge of the slab? Here's the edge of the slab. Let's just assume edge of the slab is there and work on this interior beam. Say here, this doesn't apply. This would apply, this condition here, if you have this beam, right? And sometimes, concrete slab sticks like this, out like this, right? So in one side, this is giving you five feet, and the left side is giving maybe a foot or so. So you just add it to it, okay? So this is here is going to be the effective depth, uh, width that you need to use for your concrete slab. If you have any questions, go ahead. Otherwise, I will continue. This is good. One example. It says here composite floor system. The steel beam is W18 by 35. So now I know the beam size is given to me. The spacing is nine feet. Right, so it is going to be uniformly spaced at nine feet. The concrete slab is going to be four and a half inch thick. I don't have W deck yet in our analysis. It's going to be all 
four and a half inch concrete slab. The span length, which means the span here is 30 feet. In addition to the weight of the slab, there is 20 PSF partition load. So, okay. What is this partition load? Is this dead load or life load? Let's say partitions, partitions. This is giving you life load. How about the weight of the slab and the weight of the beam? I'm gonna say here's the weight of the beam, right? This is giving you dead load, which is 35, 35 watt, P left, pump in your foot. How about the weight of the slab? I'm gonna say weight of the slab is Gabby Dillow. Should I look it up in the table? I'm gonna say no, I don't need the big table here. All what I need to do is just to count it out myself. It says here a life load of 125 PSF light manufacturing. If any life load is 100 PSF or more, I'm gonna say here no reduction. We don't reduce it, right? This is true for all life load more than or equal to 100 PSF. The steel itself is A992, which means F sub Y is equal to 50 KSI. So let me put this piece of information here. F Y equals to 50 KSI. Concrete strength is 4,000 KSI. Investigate a typical interior beam for compliance with the ISC specifications if no temporary shores are used. So I'm wondering how this can help me. No shores, what does it mean by no shores? It means it's gonna be very similar to the homework that we have done that your steel beam before it becomes composite beam, should be able to support the construction life load. This is what it means. Beam itself is not gonna be short, right? So the steel beam is gonna be able to support the concrete slab, it's gonna support itself, and it seems it's gonna be there some construction life load. It says here, assume for lateral support during construction, which means top flange is gonna be braced. So the top flange itself is not gonna be swaying, which means you can just take Moment capacity is going to be equal to Fy times Zx times the fee factor 0.9. Very similar to exactly what we have done in our home. An additional construction load of 20 PSF. Now, is this life load or dead load? Say construction life load is life load. It's construction life load. Sufficient steel anchors are provided for full composite action. This is good, which means we're going to design here for the full force to be transferred from steel to concrete. Okay, now this is going to be a kind of um, more complete problem when it comes to design, right? Because I need here to figure out the, the width of the effective width of the concrete slab. And also I'm going to have here the weights and the loads that I need to work on. So, okay. Number one, let's figure out the weights, the loads. Dead load, the slab itself. I'm not gonna go here to Verco catalog or for W section, uh, W uh, like W section for the metal deck and instead just calc out the slab weight. Four and a half is the slab thickness divided by 12 to put it in feet. Multiply by 150 with the unit weight of the concrete. It's gonna be 56 and quarter PSF per square foot. Now I have the spacing tributary width. It says here some discussion about usually normal weight concrete is like 145, but usually we use 150, like what we discussed before. So this gives you the standard number that I'm be using in my analysis. Now, since the beam is spaced as nine feet, so your tributary width is gonna be equal to nine feet. If you take this load here, multiply by nine feet, so you can get you the weight of the slab as in pump linear foot on the beam itself. As it says here, 56 and quarter times nine is gonna be the 506. Now you're trying to figure out the dead load. So you have here the concrete weight and also you have the beam weight. Beam, I know is gonna be 18 by 35. I'm gonna go back here one slide. It says 18 by 35. So dead load is gonna be also 35 P left plus the slab. So here's the slab and here's the beam weight. Add them up to each other. Here's total dead load on the beam. Okay, this is gonna be what again? 
देख लो है बात कंस्ट्रक्शन लोड व्हाट इज दिस कंस्ट्रक्शन लोड आई एम सेइंग कंस्ट्रक्शन लोड इज 20 टाइम्स 9 दिस इज लाइफ लोड राइट दिस इज हियर लाइफ लोड दिस हियर कंस्ट्रक्शन लाइफ राइट which is treated as life load yeah it is a life load okay so here see after the concrete is going to cure so what is that this is during construction during construction the steel beam supports itself plus the concrete slab and some life load during construction right now for the occupancy this means here after the concrete cures which means during the occupancy use a steel beam this section will apply right what's going to happen construction life load is not going to be there we don't have it anymore but we're going to have another life load how much is a life load say 125 as given psf but we have additional 20 psf here which is the partition if i may go back look here at this we have partitions of 20 psf it just happened that the partition weight is very similar to the construction life loop and the partition is treated as life loop so when you look here at this analysis right you see how come are they adding the occupancy load to the construction life load i'm gonna say no this number here that you're looking at this 20 actually is the partitions and which is treated as life loop this is not construction life loop you add them and then multiply by tribute through with nine feet with that you have the life load so we can say this is good occupancy life load how about dead load we can say dead load is give you the 506.3 what is this 506.3 plus 541 let me go back here just to review the numbers you can say well this is the same numbers here right there is no additional dead load you remember previously in our homework we have this additional dead load let's say that you have a ceiling right so this ceiling is going to be added after construction it's going to be during occupancy so during construction this additional dead load is not going to be used during occupancy is going to be used now in this case it just turned out to be the same right because there is no addition here dead load. okay so this is going to be for the two cases before concrete cures which means your construction and this one is going to be during occupancy all right good Let's see the effective width. Effective width, the span is 30 feet. It says here divide by four. I'm confused. Is divide by four or divide by one by like an eight? So I'm going to go back here to this discussion. I'm going to be looking here. It says one eighth of the beam span, center to center of supports from each side, right? So here you have one eighth. Here you have one eighth. If the spacing is uniform, like nine feet, nine feet, nine feet, it's gonna be one quarter. So it's exactly what he has done. And here's this analysis. We just divide here by four. Why? Because you have two sides. So let me write this down. You say two sides of the beam. All right. One eighth plus one eighth. equals one quarter of the spin so great so this is gonna be how much again it's gonna be nine inches how about the tributary width i'm gonna say tributary width it says here nine feet is gonna be 108 now which one controls i'm gonna say this one is gonna be controlling this gave me the effective width that i need to use on my analysis exactly what we've done right so we're going to be using here 90 inches how about the third issue you remember the third condition it says here from the center of the beam to the edge of the slab now we don't have this issue because this is going to be interior beam interior beam you don't really need to apply this so i'm going to be using here 90 inches questions go ahead and ask or i'm just going to continue 
Okay, let me now work with the beam. The beam 10 by 35, cross section area 10.3. Maximum force here developed in the steel beam as intention is going to be 10.3 times 50, 515. Maximum compression that this concrete is going to be able to take if you take it to any other beam or with the same beam is going to be equal to 0.85 times 4 KSI from half inch times 90 inches effective width of the concrete slab. It's going to be 1377 caps. Now, which one is going to be controlling your design? It's going to be the 515 caps because this compression cannot go beyond or cannot exceed the tension force. So I'm going to be using here 515 caps. Great. Here's 515 caps that I need to design for. Can I find out the Y distance, the YCT? I'm going to say, yeah. Let's take here 17.7 divided by 2, 8.85. Plus, for and half, you go to the top of the slab, go down by A over 2. So I need to find out this A. How much is this A compression block depth? How do you find it? You're going to set tension equals to compression, right? Same equation of the concrete that we keep on using. Is give you 1.68. Now here's the y distance based on the, the formula I just discussed with you guys. It's gonna be 12 inch. Now take this y distance, multiply by maximum compression force of 515. The moment here is gonna be in kip inch, divide this by 12, is gonna be kip foot. This for n man. Question How do you find out in man? What is missing? I'm gonna say the fee factor. Fee factor for bending of beams is gonna be 0.9. So let's just take this number here, multiply it here by 0.9, with that we have PMN. I said, okay, good. This is PMN for the composite, meaning let me look at this number here. So I want to hear first to look at this, right? You're going to be taking the 536, multiply by 0.9, it's going to get you this number here. What is this number again? It's going to be the capacity of the beam after the concrete is hardened. 536, right? 0.9 multiplied by 0.9 is going to be 483. As we said, we have here two cases. One case during construction, the other case during occupancy. So during occupancy, we're going to have here what? We're going to have this hardened, right? Concrete. Right? How about during occupancy? I'm going to say during occupancy, it was just the bare steel beam. There's no composite action. Tough flange is braced. So your moment is going to be equal to ZX. Let me type it here and say this Vmn. Vmn equals 0.9 times Fy times ZX. So, okay. Take here 0.9 times Fy times ZX. So you can get to this number here, 249. Okay. Now I need to compare this 249, which is the capacity of the bare steel beam before it gets, uh, the concrete gets to harden. And this is for the non-composite. This is going to be for the composite section. Now I need to find out how much is this ultimate moment that I'm working with when it comes to construction phase. So I'm going to say construction phase. If I, if you may go here back, to the slide that shows the loading, right? So I'm gonna say before the concrete cures, it's gonna be during construction. So let me write this down. You can see here during construction. What have during construction? I have dead load of 541.3 pound per foot and 180 pound per foot. So let me combine them. I guess I should be able to do 1.4 times dead versus 1.2 times dead plus 1.6 times life. So, okay, let's do that. It is 1.2 times dead plus 1.6 times life. Here are the load factors. So I have 937.6 pump per meter foot. Now, can I figure out the moment? The span is equal to 30 feet. Here is the load after you divide here by a thousand. Why do you divide by a thousand? Because this here is gonna be in pound per foot. I need to put as a kip per foot. W is squared divided by eight for simply supported beam. And with that, I have the moment demand during construction. It is going to be 106 kip foot. Any questions?
questions we're good now let's look here for the occupancy now occupancy case so i'm going to go back here let me look at the occupancy dead load is the same 541.3 life load change it because now i'm going to have here the light manufacturing plus the partition life load i have here 1.3 kit per foot so i'm going to be doing exactly the same thing i'm going to be taking here 1.2 dead plus 1.6 life here we go 2.7 kit per foot same thing that we've scored by by eight i have 308 kit foot as my mom demand compared to the composite section trends we have good margin here so this beam is good so this beam i'm gonna go back here this beam has given right the span is equal to 30 feet the spacing is gonna be nine feet beam section w 10 by 35 and this is able here to resist construction life load of 20 psf and during occupancy, I'm going to have 125 PSF life loop and 20 PSF for partitions. Um, questions? Yeah, any questions? Deflection check is not now, it's coming. But absolutely, if you like to complete your design, you need to have, of course, deflection check. Okay. How about the shear? Absolutely, we need to do a check on the shear. Now, the shear capacity here is going to be the same whether we have composite or non composite beam. If you remember, it's going to be equal to AV, which means the whip thickness times the total depth of the beam. Multiply by 0.6 times FY times the phi factor of 1 times C sub V. If you open also the tables, there are some tables in the steel menu. It's called ZX table. So you're going to find out for each beam size, you're going to see phi VN for it. So your phi VN, if you just open the steel table, is going to be 159 kips. Same as if you calculate out by hand yourself. Now, if the shear strength is going to be the same for both construction case and occupancy case, right? Shear strength is going to be the same because it's going to be based on the steel web only. Concrete has no contribution to it. So in this case, I just need to take this load here and determine the shear demand. I don't really need to take this and compare it to that because this is much higher. So there is no need here to back check this and that, both of them. So it's going to be taking the 2.74 kip per linear foot, multiplied by the span divided by two. It's like the reaction. This is going to be the shear demand. So my shear demand is 41 kips, capacity 159. So this beam trends wise is good. Trends wise meaning what? Meaning moment and shear. Okay, I guess we came to the end of this uh, slide set, right? So now let's flip to the second one. The following is going to be slide set number six. Let me put it on. Okay, I guess now we have everyone available. So let me take the attendance. So there's gonna be everyone is here. All right, now shear transfer mechanism. We're still working on the strength. The 
we're not at deflection yet, right? So now we need to figure out how much force we're talking about to be transferred from concrete to steel. I said in one of the problems, let's say that you have maximum compression in the concrete only by itself, the concrete slab is 1400 caps. And in the steel beam, let's say 530 caps. It means when I design the Nelson studs or shear transfer mechanism, again, designed only for 530 caps. Because what is the need to design for 1400? It is through your concrete. If you take it maybe to a larger beam, it's gonna be able to, to, to take this force. But for this steel specific, specific, specific beam, excuse me, with this concrete slab and properties, your max is gonna be 530 caps. So let's just design for that. So let's go here to the point of maximum mode. It means that you have shear force transfer from this point all the way to the reaction, to the support, and same thing from the maximum mode point all the way to the reaction, which means to the support. The force transfer from this point to here is gonna be equal exactly to the force to be transferred from this point to here, to the left side. And this force is gonna be equal to the smaller of the two forces that we just calculated out, meaning AS times FY, and 0.85 F prime C times A C. The force itself, we're gonna call it V prime. So V prime is gonna be the smaller of the tension or compression that we just discussed. The strength for one stud, which is strength, a shear strength of one stud, is gonna be called Q sub M. So this V prime, you just divide by Q sub N, which can get you here number of studs. So let's say the force from here to there is gonna be 530 kips, which is this V prime. Your stud here is gonna be able to resist, let's say 10 kips. How many studs you need on each side? You can say, this is gonna be very simple. This is gonna be 5530, the 530 divided by 10, it's gonna get you here 53 studs. So in this side, I'm gonna have here, right? This side, going to have 53 studs. And also in this side, I'm going to have additional 53 studs. You got to be careful about the distribution of the studs because it seems to me that the space is not going to be uniform, right? This is not the mid-span. This maximum moment is going to happen in the middle span if you have symmetrical life load and dead load around the axis or the center of the beam, the middle of the beam. But in this given beam, as a series of some loads to the left here, this is why this moment, maximum moment, is kind of shifted left. But at the end, you need to provide number of the studs here to be the same as number of the studs here. Someone's going to say, but this is not practical. You want me to add here 53 studs and here is gonna be 53 studs. So the space is gonna be weird, right? It's gonna be different from each side. I say, okay, here's what I have learned. Based on this distribution in the left side, the spacing for each one of these studs is gonna be equal to the distance from here to there divided by number of studs. Does this make sense? It's gonna be the spacing. And generally speaking, if the spacing turns to be, let's say, if the spacing is, I'm gonna just throw a number there, is let's say nine and a half inch. Practically, you're gonna say, let's put it at nine inches or maybe eight inches because you'd like to put more studs. How about the spacing on the right side? You're gonna be taking the same number of studs, right? And then take the distance from here, the center of the beam, this right support, divide by number of studs. It's going to get you a larger number when it comes to the spacing, right? The spacing here is going to be larger than the spacing on the left side. So let's say 10 and a half inch. I'm just throwing numbers here for discussion. So the spacing on the left side is going to be 9 inch. The spacing on the right side is going to be 10 and a half inch. So you're going to say, based on what I'm looking here at, I don't want to confuse people. Let me just put the spacing of the studs from the beginning to the end to be at 9 inches. Now you cover both sides. This is exactly what we usually do. We try to keep the spacing uniform throughout the entire beam span. By figuring out, let's say, if the center 
um, or the maximum moment of the beam, and the beam is not really centered. We just look at one side, figure out the spacing, and then just apply the spacing throughout the entire beam. Okay, good. Next. Now let's see what forces that we are talking about. So the force, as I said, this force, right? I'm gonna have a force come from here to there and a force come from there to here. So this gives you the compression force, right? To transfer the force from the top to the bottom, the force come from here is gonna be coming like this, right? And the force coming from here is gonna be like this, right? If you take this force divided here by one half of the span, so if you take the big force, the C, you remember the C, maximum compression, which means it's gonna be also the smaller of the tension compression forces, according to the analysis. If you take each one of these forces, divide by the one half of the span by the length, you get to hear something called shear flow. So shear flow units is gonna be like kip per foot. All right. Here's the compression force and the tension force, right? So you need to transfer the force from here to there. The shear flow, you can also calculate out using this equation. If you remember this equation, we discussed it this past, um, this previous uh, lecture. We say it's gonna be equal to V, total shear, right? Multiply by Q, which is the first moment of area, divided by I transfer, transform. This is gonna be for the transformed section. Now the question is what what is this Q? As we said, it's giving the first moment of inertia, right? Is the first moment of inertia? Is this correct? Or this is the typo? Can someone help me with this? Is it first moment of what? Can someone help me please? Is this first moment of inertia or first moment of area? Area. That was a typo. Which one is a typo? This inertia. This is wrong. It should have been first moment of area. Okay. So I'm going to cross this out. Now it's kind of confusing because the term used here is Q, but when I go back a couple of slides, I see here Q sub n. Are they related to each other? I'm going to say no. This Qn is a shear strength. of one stud, right? Let's give you as in caps. So units, I'm gonna say in caps. But this Q here is different. This give you inch cube because area is give you square inches multiplied by another inch is give you inch cube. So this Q here is gonna be, let me put this down. Let's give you inch. Great, now I guess I understand what's going on and this shear here needs to be supported by the studs. How this is transferred. Let's say that this concrete slab is gonna stay in place. Okay. Now all of a sudden you start here to attach this is studs to the steel beam. So actually the studs that you're looking here at, actually it is gonna be part of the steel beam, right? Now, once you start here to pull this, don't forget this give you like the reaction. Once you start to pull this concrete slab in this direction and the steel beams give you staying in place. Now the concrete transfer, the shear transfer between the concrete to the steel is gonna be through bearing on the studs. And actually at the end, this gave you like shear throughout the stud section. So the strength of each stud is not just based on the material of the stud, it's gonna be also based on the concrete. Because imagine if you just put this stud, let's say here in this location, right? The amount of concrete that you are pushing against is gonna be all of this concrete piece, right? Which is great. But imagine that you put it right here. So I'm gonna put it right here. What's gonna add to the concrete? Now you start to push, right? 
on the concrete. You easily can break this piece. See this piece of concrete? They're gonna fade it. And the stud is gonna be having very low strength because the stud is gonna be strong, is welded to the steel beam. The problem with the concrete is gonna be fading right here in this location. So this gonna be an issue. There is certain tolerance, acceptable tolerance when you install the studs. And I guess we have gone through this last time, two lectures ago, when you're looking at vertical catalog and they give me here maximum distance, right? Or minimum distance to keep from the edge of the flute to the center of the stud. Okay, now I guess I understand it more. Understand here that the strength of each stud, which is Q sub N, is gonna be based on the stud material and also on the concrete, the surrounding concrete. So, okay. Now the metal deck here spans perpendicular to the steel beam, correct? You see, it spans perpendicular here to the slide, to the screen. Span this way. But how about the other steel beam running parallel to this flutes, to the metal deck? Now imagine this stud when it works in the other direction here, right? Perpendicular. It's gonna be much stronger. So in here it's gonna be much weaker because you can break this concrete or this concrete or this concrete, right piece. But when the flute is parallel to the steel beam, let's say here's a steel beam and then you set the concrete right on top of it. Uh, if you give me a second, I can show you what I'm talking about. Let me change the sharing. You guys, you have seen this before. It's like set number five. Look at the flute. The flute here is paired to the steel beam. The other picture I showed you, it was perpendicular to it, right? So now just imagine that the shear is gonna be now perpendicular to the page or to the slide. Now we have a long piece of concrete that sits on the top of the steel beam, which is gonna make the stud itself is gonna be stronger when it bears on the concrete. So we have two cases here. We have one case when this flute is gonna be perpendicular to the beam. We have another case when this flute is parallel to the beam. And then we have a third case when we have just concrete deck, solid concrete deck, like what? You can say like the examples we have been solving, right? You have here solid concrete deck. So in this case, you don't have an issue of breaking the concrete in one side. Like in this case, just imagine that you have full solid here concrete slab. You say, okay, so concrete bearing is not gonna be an issue. It's gonna be just about the stuff. So yes. Now let's see how the code is recognizing this issue. The code says here Q sub N, which means the strength of one stud is given by this equation. Let's start this is equation. I'm gonna say this equation actually just like two equations. Let me split them. Here's the first one, and here's the second equation. Code says your strength is gonna be equal to the smaller of these two values. So each one of these equations represent or represents a case. The first one is gonna be about the concrete strength. So this is gonna be about the concrete, right? We discussed this issue of concrete bearing, right? The stud is gonna be bare on the concrete and this kind of things. The second one here is gonna be on the steel. Okay, good. Here's the first one. First one says 0.5 times A S sub A. This is gonna be cross section area of the anchor, of the steel anchor. S A means the steel anchor. Cross section area of the stud. So the stud, the size that we usually use in construction is three quarter of an inch. Okay, so the standard size we use three quarter of an inch diameter. So you need to find out the cross section area of that stud. So understand what is this A sub this A. F prime C is going to be concrete strength, and E C is going to be the model plasticity for the concrete. We usually like what we say here in the ACI that the ACI code is a PSI code. Whenever you see F prime C, you're gonna be using it in PSI. Whenever you use EC, it's gonna be PSI. But in this specific equation, you cannot do this. 
this equation here, they say this F prime C, it has to be in case sign. If I have 4,000 PSI concrete, I'm gonna be using four in this equation. E sub C is gonna be also in case sign. Do you guys know how to find out E sub C? Right, we did it last time in the example. We says gonna be equal to 57,000 square root of F prime C, right? We discussed it last time and we caught a mistake in the analysis in the example that we had, the copies from the book, that they used it, they showed it to be as in 4K sign, which was wrong. It has to be 4P sign in the ACI equation. But in here, they're very specific. They say this needs to be here in K sign, and E sub C also needs to be in K sign. They say good. The second equation, I have here F sub U, ultimate strength, of the Nelson stud, and just so you know, this is equals to how much? 65. Okay, sorry. Standard. I'm gonna show you all of that. It's gonna be coming soon. Time the cross section area of the steel anchor. Yeah, so now this is getting shear. Let's see the two multipliers R sub G, R sub T. What's R sub G stands for? It's gonna be for group action. So for group action, Let's say that you have one stud versus two studs and both of them, they bear in the concrete. I'm gonna say when you have group, I'm gonna have lower strength. So once you start to put two rows of studs, I'm gonna reduce the strength a little bit for each one of the studs. Why? Because you're gonna have your combined stresses come from both studs to the concrete. If you just have one stud, I'm gonna give you here a factor of one. Let's say once you start here to add a stud, I need to reduce it. So you're gonna have an RG, it's gonna have a value less than one. Okay, how about the RP? RP says here, as it says, for the effect factor of shear stud, we're gonna see this very soon. This can be for the position. Where are you gonna put it? You remember we said, would you put to the right, would you put to the left? It depends on the shear force, right? Where it's coming from. So okay. Now we have here two values for RG and RP. As it says here, RG, if you have solid slab, no metal deck, R sub G is going to be equal to 1.0. How about RP for the position? It's going to be 0.75 for solid slab. Okay. Let me see the following table. It's going to make my life a little bit easier. Can I say here, here's RP and here's R sub G. Here's the two values. For which case, no metal deck because it says here no decking. So it's kind of confusing. Someone's gonna say, but do you have concrete deck? I'm gonna say no metal deck, only concrete deck. So this give you the first case. Like the previous examples that we have done here, right? We had concrete deck, but we didn't have any metal deck. In this case, R sub G is one, R sub P is 0.75. I'm gonna say, okay. Now, metal deck in this hole, so it's gonna be metal decks. When it says here decking, it means metal deck. So let me write this. You see here, metal deck. This also gave me metal deck case. This gave me only concrete deck. So it does mean only metal deck. I'm gonna say yes, metal deck and concrete deck. Someone's gonna say it doesn't mean that we don't have concrete deck. I'm gonna say no. And both of them. So what happened here, I said, when you have only concrete deck, no metal deck, just very thick concrete slab throughout the top of the beam, one and 0.75. So, okay, let's look here when the deck is gonna be parallel to, which means the flutes of the metal deck is gonna be parallel to the steel beam. What's gonna happen? They say, well, you have two cases here. You have something called the width and the height of what? Of the rip. 
where is the width, where is the height? You can say, here's the width and here's the height. Now I'm gonna rip height in inches. This is gonna be average width of concrete rip. So I'm gonna go here. Now where is the rip height? Rip height is gonna be this. You see this? It's gonna be the rip height. We used to call it W2 or W3, which means it's gonna be two or three inches. This is gonna be the rip height. How about the rip width? Let me show you what does mean by the rip width. You're gonna be taking it from one half over here. Look at this. One half over here, right? One half of this distance, and this is giving W sub R distance from here to there, right? Which is right here. If you look here at this one, which is this one here, W R. So you can say, okay, what is the standard this W R is going to be equal to? You guys recall from vertical catalog? Do you remember what width are we talking about? Yes? How much was it? I say, well, well, what I remember from here to here was equal to 12 inches, right? From here, I'm gonna put here a big line. Right? From this line to this line is 12 inches. But from here to there, is it half of it? You guys agree? Is it half or more or less? What do you guys think? Right? Six inches? Let's say six inches. So the width is gonna be six inches. If you have the deck, it's gonna be three inches or two inches, it means that you're gonna be in this category, right? So it is gonna be very standard that when you look at this case, when the deck is gonna be parallel to the steel shape, you're gonna be in here. Which means it's gonna be the same as you have concrete slab. So R sub G, R sub P for the full concrete slab is gonna be usually the same as, right? This two values is gonna be very similar to those two values. When you have the metal deck is gonna be parallel to the steel beam. Now, when the metal deck is gonna be perpendicular to the steel beam. So I'm gonna leave this slide and go back, just look at the picture. You can say like in this case, what's gonna happen, right? So, okay, in a case like this, they say, how many studs do you have in a row? Is it one stud? So, okay, your RG factor is one, and RP factor is gonna be 0. 0.6. If you have two studs, it's gonna be 0. 0.85 and 0. 0.6, which means this RP is not changing. That once you have the group, this is gonna be R sub G, and I was gonna start to show, it's gonna be one, 0. 0.85 and 0. 0.7. So usually we try to make only one stud in a row, right? as much as possible. But at certain beam size, if the beam is really big and I really need to have this with composite action, I need to put a couple of studs in a row. In a case like this, I'm gonna be reducing the stud capacity to 85%, so I'm gonna have a reduction of 15% for each stud. Any questions? Yes, any questions? All right. Well, also in the code for the steam manual, they give you this table, very nice table. It says when there is no deck, of course, they, they are not talking about concrete deck, they're just talking about metal deck. When the deck is parallel, when the deck is perpendicular, and then you have one, two, three, one, two, three. So the good thing is for each concrete strength, 3K psi, 4K psi, when you have normal weight concrete, when you have lightweight concrete. So this table is good. We can just use it if we need to. The top of the table, it says here, there is no metal deck. What anchor size that you'd like to use? I'm gonna say three quarter of an inch. This gives you the very typical one. 
Do we use lightweight? I'm gonna say yes. Normal weight, yes. What the standard? Usually it's gonna be three KSI and three KSI. So your capacity is gonna be maybe 17.1 for lightweight and maybe 21 for normal weight concrete. So I'm talking about these two values, which is very common in our analysis. I'm gonna say this one, right? And this one. Okay. Do we use three eight to an inch? I'm guessing no. This is a very common one. I don't want to go seven eight or an inch. Three quarter should be good enough. This is just based on the typical beam design that you're gonna be using in your analysis, right? But if you need larger to reduce the spacing or to increase the spacing between the studs, right? Or and reduce the number of studs and you'd like to use an inch, it's gonna be fine. But this is very common in the market. I mean, this is available, easy to find. Okay. What is that? You can say, okay, this is when the dick is parallel. So let's do this trick or this trial. It's gonna be a kind of a test. Three quarter of an inch, normal weight concrete, three KSI, 21 kips. We go back here. Remember, dig parallel, 3 KSI, 3 quarter. Parallel, 3 KSI, okay, it's the same. So when the beam is parallel, right, to the metal deck ribs or flutes, it's gonna be performed very similar to that one when you have just concrete slab and no metal deck. Look at the values, 21, it's gonna be 21. 5, 8, 14.6, 14.6. So it's gonna be the same. Now this explains these factors, right? One and 1.7.7, five. Because these two factors are the same, this is why the forces in the table here, and in here is gonna be the same. When you have this condition applies, and this condition usually applies in most cases. Okay? Okay, good. So I'm gonna be moving here for when the deck is gonna be perpendicular, right? And then you have weak stud, you have one, two, three, and you have the same thing. So we have here, you can just look up the stud strength, okay? Any questions? Okay. We're gonna see here one example that we just used. Now we'd like to continue and find out number of slots. The same steel beam that we designed in example three. We see that left slab thickness is four and a half, span is gonna be 30 feet, concrete strength is gonna be four KSI, and the force compression maximum, which means AS times F sub Y. It's going to be equal to 515 kips, which is the same as the C. This is going to be V prime. Now, what stud would you like to use? I'm going to be using half inch stud, right? It's going to be half inch stud. Cross section area, 0.19, almost 0.2 square inches. He is obscene, like 3,500 KSI based on this equation. Same thing, you see this four? Let's say, be careful about this one. So I'm gonna write here P side or K side. Now, here's the equation, the trends of, for one stud, just one stud. Now we would like to do analytically in this example. So I'm gonna say two equations. Here's the first one, right? First equation, which is based on the concrete strength. And this has to be in K side and also E sub C has to be in K side. So this is 0.5 times the cross-section area. And absolutely, if you're doing some analysis in a homework, in actual design, in an exam, in a quiz, you don't really need to go that crazy behind this number. So you can just call it 0.2 square inches, right? It's not gonna change anything in your design, I guess. Times the square root of 4K side times the 3492. 
The capacity for one stud here, half inch stud, this gave you 11.6 caps. Now you try the second equation. Here's the second equation. Right? So here's the second equation. This gave you R sub G and R sub P. Now I have concrete slab. This gave me solid concrete slab. So let me go back to the table. Solid concrete slab. As I remember, it is 1.75 for R sub G and R sub P. Now let me move forward to this example solution. So I have here 1 and 0.75 for R sub G, R sub P. Cross section areas give me the same, nearly 0.2 square inches. F sub U for the stud, 65. So it's going to say, yeah, I remember we mentioned 65. Also, I'm going to say, you know what? If you forgot this number, you don't know where to find it. Just come here. Look at this. It's going to be 65 case sign for the Nelson stud. Now, this turned to be 9.57. Now, which value to use? Is it the 11.6 or the 9.57? Look at the equation, how it's set. When you have two equations for the strength, you're gonna take the smaller root two. So you're gonna be taking QN for one start, this gave you 9.57 kips. Okay, so one start is gave you resisting 9.5. How much force that you need to transfer from the top to the bottom of the beam from concrete? I'm gonna say 515, okay. Let's take here 515 divided by the strength for one stud. It says here 53.8. Is this for one half of the steel beam or the entire length of the steel beam? You can say, no, this is gonna be for one half. Why? Because this force that you're talking about, the 515 is gonna be from this point, maximum moment to the support. And you have another 515 from maximum moment to the support. So I'm gonna have here like 54 on this side and 54 on this side. It says here 53 equal spaces. It means what? What does it mean by that? Do you have really 53 equal spaces? It says here at six and a half inch, you're gonna have plus or minus 108 studs. So actually I need 108, it's gonna be 54 times two. Minimum is gonna be 54 for one half of the beam or 108 total. If you like to use one stud, right? Like only a row of one stud. So the distance or the space in between two studs is gonna be how much? Total span, the 30 feet, right? Times 12, because gonna be 12 inches to put in inches, divide this by number of studs. You're gonna have almost three inches. But someone's gonna say, this is gonna be very tight when it comes to the spacing. Why don't we put a row of two studs? Which makes more sense. Now, but you may need to go back and study what's gonna happen, right? Because you're gonna say now the stud spacing is gonna be like six inches, it makes sense. At each about six inches, you're gonna put a couple of studs next to each other. But what does it mean by that? Does mean by that? Is this more acceptable than this solution? You can say, of course, yes. I don't like to put just one stud here. I'm gonna put two studs next to each other. Now, in some cases, once you put two studs, it means the strength of the studs is gonna get reduced, correct? You remember this when you have one and two and three? But the good thing, if I may take you back here, the good thing, having two studs per row, or three studs per row does not affect the trends of the stud when you have no decking, when you have no metal deck, like in our example. So in our example here, no change for the strength. But if you have a case like this, you have deck perpendicular to the steel section. Once you add two, trends is gonna get reduced. But in our example, there's no reduction here in the trends because you're gonna have here a row of two studs next to each other, okay? Okay, good. All right, this makes sense. I'm happy the trends is not get reduced. I can just put here uh, two rows if I want to. Um, like the question here, in this case, we don't really need to do new calculations. 
because the strengths is not going to change. We're just lucky that we, when we have this one solid concrete slab, if you have one stud per row or two studs per row, it's not going to change the strength. Now look here at this value that I was just calculated out, 9.57 caps. What was the size? Half an inch. Concrete strength? Oh, it's giving normal weight, 4,000. Let's look here at the steel table and see what do we have. Um, yeah, to answer the question of wool, um, if we have metal and concrete, and the metal was perpendicular to the steel sections. In this case, yes, we do. Because if the metal deck is parallel to the steel beam section, there is no reduction, right? I can take you back here. Look at this. Look at the factors. If you have metal deck, and parallel to the steel section, there is no reduction when you have a row of two studs. It happens only when the metal deck is perpendicular to the steel section, right? So if you are in one of these cases, in the first or the second one, there is no reduction if you use two per row. In the third case, you're gonna have reduction. And the reduction is how much? It's gonna be 15% from one per row to two per row, you see this? It means 15% because this factor is going to stay the same. All right, now we'd like to see our calculations that we have done here versus if you just look it up in the table. So I'm going to say, okay, let's look it up in the table. Half an inch, normal weight concrete, 4,000 KSI. The strength for one stud is 957. You see this number here? 1957. This is great. So it is either that. You use this equation here, or you can just look it up. It's gonna be okay either way. Uh, questions before I let you go? Oh, um, you said three inches was uh, too small for the spacing, uh, practically. What What's yeah. the minimum that you would consider? I'd like to go to six inches. This is gonna be the smallest. Otherwise, okay, it's gonna be it's gonna be too much for a wheelbarrow to just go three inches. I mean, stop. It's gonna be really congested. Okay. Any other questions? Um, what does the aiming for that table back there, with the the point five the the table that showed the value for the for the um this one. Uh, uh, back a little more to that the one table that has the, the values for like the um R, the parallel and the perpendicular. Yeah, that table. Yeah, yeah like for the point eight five for R G, there's like a sm small A next to it on the top right of the point eight five for R G for the. Oh, oh, you mean this one here? Yeah, yeah. Okay, this is not A. Okay. Um, this is not A, my friend. Look at not A. It says for a single steel headed stud anchor so this is gonna be a very specific case right uh -huh. you see this this condition here but usually we're gonna be here you remember this discussion that usually we're gonna be in here because the width is gonna be six inches and the metal deck is gonna be two or three inches right okay so we're gonna be here in most cases we're gonna be in this section here so you don't have to worry about this Okay. Okay. Good. All right, guys. See you next time. It's gonna be in person in class. Okay. All right. Have a good night.